He's a medical examiner. Uh, actually, he's the professor and chair of pathology at Howard University, but I met him when he was chief medical examiner in DC. Uh, but let me welcome back to the show, Dr. Roger Mitchell. Hi. Hey, Karen. Hey, long time no see. Man, you know, you look good. How are you doing? Oh, look at look, look at you. I look like a snack. Thank you. I, I appreciate you. You look good too. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Great to see you. Yes. Let me introduce you to, doc, to uh, I want to call her doctor. She should be. Uh, Tanya Pinkins is here as well. Uh, Tony Award winning, uh, brilliant person. Um, and it's interesting. We just had Dr. Carl Hart on talking about drug use. And I know you have sure. some understanding of this because we, when we met, when, we, when you came in, we were talking about your experience, but what you saw in DC and, and other places as it relates to drug, but your own personal story. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. And, and like you said, I used to be the chief medical examiner and in that role as a forensic pathologist, we, we see overdoses, overdose deaths as, a, as one of the you know, leading causes of death that we see in, 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 our, in our jurisdiction, particularly I was in DC or I was the chief in DC. Um, so opioid use and abuse is, is still running rampant. I, you know, in the midst of the COVID epidemic, um, we saw an increase in um, overdoses among, um, among primarily older black men and women in, in the district because there's over 90%, close to 95% of all opioid overdose deaths had fentanyl on board. Um, and fentanyl we know is you know, 10 to 20 times more potent than morphine, which is the active component of, of heroin. And so, man, devastating families. Um, along with the violence that we're seeing in the community as well as um, the COVID that, we, that hit our community hard. Um, my own personal stories, my dad was crack cocaine addicted my whole childhood. Um, and so uh, I grew up with, with him and, and, and seeing how he freebased coke and how he was addicted as, you know, again, it's a mental and physical health addiction, but um, later in life was able to, to, to help him uh, get sober and me and him have been friends for the last, I guess, 15 years, him sober um, and completely rehabilitated. But, um, but yeah, drugs is, is devastating in, in all communities that, that are affected. Now I'm struggling because there, there are two conversations and I think we converge the conversation. We, we, we have them concurrently and we shouldn't. We should not have them overlap. One is legalization versus illegalism, you know, like the criminalization of drug use, the criminalization of drugs, period, uh, is political. And it is, it is, it is about power. It is about, you know, being able to take particularly a group of people, because those are the only people who are being policed around these issues of drugs, and then incarcerated, you know, that's a separate conversation from our drugs bad for our bodies, you know, drug use. And, and, and even that, is, you know, marijuana, different strains of cannabis can be very useful versus, you know, we were talking about psychedelics. Some of them are, very, you know, there, there are different layers of conversations that mm -hmm. we should be having, but I don't think we're capable of having those, those layered conversations because for those of us who are impacted by people who have been addicted, there's no negotiating, you know, drugs are bad because this is my experience. Where do you sit in terms of legalization, criminalization? Well, you know, I, 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 I appreciate you trying to unlayer the layers, right? Because at the end of the day, it's not a, a, a black and white conversation. Um, at the end of the day, whenever we, uh, whenever we use substances, no matter what it is, whether it's alcohol or whether it's illicit substances, it's a way of self-medicating. So then the question becomes, what are you self-medicating, right? So are you self-medicating trauma that happened as a childhood? Are you self-medicating your current depression, anxiety? You know, what, what are you self-medicating and how are you self-medicating it, right? Because we all have to fill holes, right? So now we're getting into the spiritual constructs of things, which really everything boils down to in my world. Um, and so no, drugs aren't good for you per se, but... At, at particular dosages, there are drugs that are fantastic for you. I mean, at the, at the root of all the chemicals that are in pharmaceuticals are, you know, plant-based uh, um, constructs that, that heal body, 
right? And allow for us to deal with the anxiety and depression of life and the liver disease and heart disease that comes along with it and the ability to digest sugar properly. Um, you know, all of these things, you know, at the, it's all about nutrition. It's all about what we put into our body. And so as westernized humans and particularly those of us that are slave descendants that have been marginalized and disenfranchised by institutional structural racism to keep us sick and keep us dying. We have to, we find ourselves trying to medicate ourselves with the things that are being provided to us versus the things that are naturally occurring, right? Because we don't have the knowledge of things that are naturally occurring to be able to help our depression, right? You know, how many of us know, you know, St. John's wort, right? How many of us use the things that may come, you know, naturally occurring to help us deal with our day-to-day -day issues? How many of us know that we really only need to eat once a day and it's better to eat after, you know, 16 to 20 hours fasting, right? Mm. So, and, and drink a whole bunch of water, right? So, so I know that's, that is as, as a layered answer as the question that you asked, um, but no, I'm not a fan of criminalizing um, drug use uh, because I know what my dad was dealing with to make him a drug addict. But that being said, there is violence, homicidal violence that finds itself connected to the drug trade. And although I am a violence preventionist, there are some people that need to be rehabilitated behind the walls of uh, of the incarceral system, right? So if you kill a child, then yes, you're sick. You may need issues to deal with your trauma, the things that may have, you wanted to pick up a gun, the things that, that put you in the drug trade. But guess what? You can't kill a five-year-old and me rehabilitate you out on the street. We're going to have to rehabilitate you behind the bars. And then that goes to what is a real role and goal of these institutions, our hospital institutions, as well as our carceral institutions, what are their real goal? And are they doing what they, what they should be doing? And so there's so many different questions because we live in, in a, a country that is laden with white supremacy that, um, that we have to unpack if we're gonna really get to the root of things that affect our community. I miss you. Um, uh, we, we, uh, we've been away too long, Dr. Yeah. Roger Mitchell, here on these airwaves. I know you've you made some moves. So you're at Howard now where everybody and their mother is at Howard. You are, <laughs> you're, <laughs> it's like, damn, Howard is the Mecca for real. Yeah, for um, real. how did, how did they lure you? And, and when you teach pathology, what, 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 what is it that you're actually teaching? What are you teaching? Well, yeah. So, you know, you know, I was the chief medical examiner. I worked for government my whole career for about 15 years. I was a medical examiner in multiple places, Houston, New York, um, DC, New Jersey. Um, and there comes a time where, you know, you know, my voice, I, I, you know, as a government employee, you can't say everything you want to say. You can't do everything you want to do. And so I prayed um, since, since the last time we talked, I became an ordained minister. Um, and so um, you know, God has really kind of brought me in a space and place where, you know, he, he wants me to use an unadulterated voice. And so I asked him for that. And he brought this opportunity for Howard to come where unadulterated voices are something that they, they, they're used to dealing with. If, if they like it or don't, um, they're used to dealing with it. And so, and they don't usually fire black people that talk truth. Mm. Um, and so I wanted to be in a space where I could speak truth. So that's my probably my biggest impetus for coming um, to Howard. And then being able to teach young uh, medical students about pathology, which is the study of disease, right? And, and really getting, ex getting them excited about a discipline that has a paucity of um, black and brown faces in it. I wanted to, you know, try to show them that they could be themselves and they could see, you know, someone who is connected to culture and understands the things of the world and are, is engaged, but not necessarily a clinician that sees patients every day. So sees it a little bit different through laboratory medicine um, and autopsy. And so, um, so hoping to make an impact on, on the future of our medical students here at Howard. 
All right, so I'm gonna put the number out. 866-801-8255. Of course, open the floors here for questions. What is it that you've learned about COVID-19? And it's now 59 iterations since uh, we first heard about it through pathology. What do you, you know, know about this disease, virus? Let me tell you something, Karen, Tanya. It's a monster. It's, it's a monster. Um, if you are someone who does not have a good baseline of health, right? So you're obese, diabetic, cancer, anything that suppresses your immune system or increases your baseline inflammation, right? So you might have an autoimmune disorder, anything that does that, if this gets up on you, you're going to have a problem, right? And so, you know, as the medical examiner, I, I stood up you know, the disaster morgue and, and you know, process, you know, pushed through and dealt with a th you know, over a thousand families that came through. And that's a small number, you know, um, compared to the 650,000 individuals that died, you know, in the entire country to date. You know, all those jurisdictions have lost loved ones. And they, in our community, you know, they're the moms and pops and grandpops. They're the they're the breadwinners, the ones that are going out, frontline workers that had to work and are bringing home checks. Um, but this disease, it affects the lungs. We know that it affects the hearts um, of individuals. Um, it affects the GI tract of individuals. Um, and so, um, so yeah, it's a pretty, a pretty, pretty bad disease. Um, at least it, it was. Uh, the healthcare industry got better at treating it. Right. So they got better at treating, they got better at not putting people on respirators right away and kind of letting people kind of deal with it until, res uh, you know, respiration, respirators were, were necessary. So they got better at treating it. And then quite frankly, you know, um, you know, the vaccine is, is, is extremely helpful um, for those people that have baseline inflammation. Right, and so those people that are at higher at risk, um, you know, are going to be in a position where they can fight off the virus in 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 a small way through the vaccine. So if they saw big insults, they have a better ability to respond to a big insult of the natural of the natural virus. So, um, and then individuals that in general keep their inflammation down. So those people that drink a lot of water, those people that exercise, those people that are you know, engaging, we're going to be, um, you know, in position to be a better, uh, be able to fight off when, when, and if they get the virus. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's, what, what does it hard. actually do? You know, a lot of people, oh, it's just like the flu or it's yeah, just no. like, you know, what, what does it do? Because it's not just the, the lungs or the heart or the brain, because there's a lot of brain right. fog, there's vascular, you know, blood clots, like what the hell yeah. You know, wh why does it show up so many different kinds of ways for different people? And so what is it actually doing when it gets in? And, um, you know, I'm, I was talking to somebody and they were like, you know, it's it's the amount of, you know, exposure that you get. So I'm like, I can't go back to my gym because there are too many people in here without a mask. And I, it's just a matter of time. And so I'm like, I just haven't been to the gym in a couple of months. And this is bad because I want to go to the gym. But I also know folk don't take this seriously enough. And I don't want to get caught out there. But what does it do when it gets into your system? And how much of it needs to be in for it to catch? So at the end of the day, what it does is it promotes inflammation, right? It promotes inflammation. So um, the virus gets in a it gets uh, into your, the lining of your uh, airway walls. It'll get into the lining of your vessels. It reproduces there and reproduces more virus. And then what happens is, is that the body says, let's fight this virus. And it's really the, the response, the inflammatory response that's destructive. So it's, it's not necessarily the, it is the virus but it's our bodies fighting the virus, fights the virus so much, the collateral damage is our lung tissue. The collateral damage is the, is the vessel wall. The collateral damage is you know, our, our, the, the, the um, cells within our brain. It's, it's that inflammatory- So it turns the body response. into an autoimmune 
it's like it operates like an autoimmune disease where it turns the body onto itself yeah almost like it yeah it it, it's the inflammatory response um to 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 the virus and those people that have higher inflammation at baseline so elderly individuals have higher inflammation that's going on in their body um baseline individuals that are obese have higher in inflammation that's in their body baseline those that already have autoimmune have higher inflammation in their body baseline it, diabetics so if you ha already have a higher threshold of inflammation and then you get this this um uh, uh this virus then the inflammation just completely boils over and takes over the system and that's functionally why because inflammation is not localized, that's why you can get it. The inflammate, you can get the response in in different organ systems. Doctor Roger, what are your thoughts on Regencove? Tell me what Regencove is. It's the monoclonal antibodies that Doctor Fauci and Santos are pushing. The intravenous um, monoclonal antibodies. Well, I'll tell you that I haven't done much work on um, Regencove, so I'm not going. I'll, I'll hold my my response. Um, response to that. Well, my other question for you was, because you're a medical examiner, I don't know if you had followed in any way the Kendrick Johnson case, the young 17-year-old um, student in Valdosta, Georgia, where they um, ruled his death an accident and there were no organs in the body and newspaper was in the body. Is that a normal medical, you know, when you're doing the coroner, is that a normal practice to take someone's organs out and fill it with newspaper? Well, you know, normal medical examiner, I'll tell you this, that the medical legal death investigation in this, in this country, the system is a mixed system of a medical examiner system and a coroner system. Coroners do not have to be physicians um, and they're elected officials. Some coroners are not elected officials and they, they are physicians, forensic pathologists like myself, um, but there is no, there is no, I'll say it again, there is no uniformity of practice wow. on how the medical legal death investigation system is run in this country. Um, and so depending on where you live and die, it depends on how you get treated as, in death by a medical examiner. Now, as far as you know, paper and filling uh, a body with newspaper, I have heard that being done in jurisdictions. Um, uh, uh, you know, I did. You know, we didn't do that in D.C., New Jersey, Houston, New York. Um, that, you know, where I've worked, um, but I've heard that that has been done um, in the past with you know removal um, of of the organs. Um, yeah, so you know, uh, I'll, I'll tell you this, uh, especially particularly when we're talking about deaths in custody. There's a lot to be desired on the uniform of how our medical examiners and um, coroners um, approach deaths in custody or even deaths of, 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 of um, poor and, and, and black people in this country. So you're saying wow. in some jurisdictions, a coroner is somebody who could be political. 100%. Not, not using science, not using what they're, they're actually seeing, but it could be a political it could person. Be, so their job would be to determine cause and manner of death, and they're elected by the community. So New Orleans, I mean, Louisiana is a good example. Those parishes are coroners. Um, 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 another good example, there's several. Pennsylvania has several coroner counties. Um, uh, and, you know, they, you know, their coroners are not equal to poor performance. So there are some coroners that are elected and understand their limitations and lean heavily on physicians to inform the cause and manner of death. A good example of that is in Las Vegas, uh, which is a coroner system, but they employ medical examiners to help them establish cause and manner of death. Los Angeles is a coroner system um, that, that works well with medical examiners to ensure that, those med that, that cause and manner of death comes out appropriately. Um, but there are vestiges of coroner systems in this country that, yes, you know, there's political corruptness with those coroner systems. Uh, but I'll say this, 
that could be the same with medical examiner systems, quite frankly. Um, so really there needs to be a complete, and there's no federal oversight. So there's no the CDC, Department of, the Department of Health, the National Institute of Justice, there is no oversight to local state coroner um, and county medical examiners. Um, so when they do one of our people hang in a suicide, there's nobody to say no, because they have the authority in their state to do what they, to call it whatever they want to call it. You know, coroners and medical examiners have an abundance of power wow. um, to establish cause and manner of death. Um, and so you really want to develop a, what we're talking about across the country is um, really developing a robust peer review process, uh, a robust quality control process for the medical legal death investigation system. And, and, and you know, you know, Hunter, you know, Karen, your, your nation um, here can really um, talk through and, and, and call their representatives and say they want a uniform way of how death investigation is done in this country. Where do we, who do we call? Well, you're local. So if you're, if you're locally, you'll be your local county officials, your local state officials. Um, and, and that's really where the coroners and the medical examiners live. I want to ask you about the pop culture effect on this, because I remember I talked to nurses about the effect of um, Grey's Anatomy on their system and how as a television show, which has been on over 15 years, there are no nurses. And so they found this decrease in people wanting to be nurses because they don't see representation of nurses and all they do in television. So are you telling me, what were the people in CSI, which was originally Las Vegas and Miami, what were they? Like, I mean, they were beautiful actors with dead body porn, but like, how does the popular culture contribute to this misinformation and this ability for us to get, you know, assume things that are wrong. Hmm. I mean, I, I mean, I think you in your question, right, is is much of the answer. Um, you know, I I was the first black man in FBI laboratories back in 1997. Uh, um, and I was a forensic scientist. I was a forensic biologist. And so this was before CSI, uh, um, you know, um, O.J. Simpson trials, what got me into forensics, because um, I was doing DNA work in a local Howard laboratory because I did undergraduate here. Um, but there is a what they call a CSI effect, right? That jurors believe that there's a level of technology and a level of expediency that doesn't exist in real life. Mm. Um, uh, and families believe that too, right? And community believes it too. Um, now, I'll say that since I started forensics back in 97 and now in 2021, we're getting close. I mean, the stuff that we can do from a tech standpoint is close to, to what um, is being shown on TV um, and is, is, you know, if there wasn't a backlog and a huge volume, the expediency would be as fast as, as what TV shows it to be. So, you know, from a forensic standpoint, and I've, I've done a lot of work in looking at, you know, movies, and I've done some forensic expert work for, for TV and film. And so I know that a lot of that is based in, it's, it's based in real stuff. It's just a, it, the way they put it together is fictionalized. Um, so you have to, we have to pierce it, we have to parse it out for, for our community. So how much can one get DNA off of someone's clothing, I know a hair or something, but I'm, I'm, you know, I just watched this Kendrick Johnson documentary last night, and it's like if his body was shoved into this mat and there's bruising on his hands, like defensive wounds, would is there even years later they've exhumed him several times? Would there be DNA from other people? Is how long does that, you know, data last? Yeah, I mean, not to speak to his case specifically, right? Because I don't know the ins and outs of that, right? But you know, DNA can last forever, right? I mean, we've we've we pulled Lucy out, right? And you know, out of the uh, out of the soils of Africa and found that she was connected to all of us, right? Through DNA, so DNA can last for forever, particularly mitochondrial DNA that lives in bones. Um, but yeah, DNA. You know, I've worn this shirt all day, so you know, cells from, you know, skin cells from my neck are in this collar of this shirt. So if somebody were to 
you know, and I was eating earlier and probably had a little saliva on my tie, you know, so there's, there's ways to get DNA off of clothing. Um, does it preserve and last burial? You know, that level of DNA would not, it's exposed to the elements, it would denature, but um, there is, there is DNA that can last. I've, I've had a cold case where we identified there was semen from a vaginal swab that was placed on a slide 30 years ago. And um, it was never looked at for properly. And um, I looked at the slide, found the, found the sperm on the slide, and then they took the cover slip off and was able to get DNA off the slide after 30 years. So, so there is, you know, depending on the circumstances, um, you can get DNA, but not every circumstances will yield. Why pathology? Um, I know you've answered it before. Yeah, that was like sure. four or five years ago. Dr. Roger Mitchell is here. He's the chair of pathology at Howard University. Uh, you went to medical school. You went through the whole thing. Why did you choose this path? Well, I, um, like I said, I worked for the FBI. And when I was there, the items of evidence of violent crime were coming from poor and Black communities. Um, and our communities have suffered from violence um, at the hands of ourselves and others. And so um, I got exposed to this concept of post-traumatic stress disorder uh, back in the 90s. I uh, read David Satcher's book on youth violence um, right around that time in the, in the mid 90s. And it all came together and I wanted to study violence as a public health issue. And I thought the best way to study violence as a public health issue was to become a forensic pathologist once I was exposed to forensic science as a, as a young person um, of 22 years old. So. I was pre-med, my grandfather was a doctor, so I wanted to be a doctor for a long time. Um, and that, that light bulb went off and I said, man, I wanna be a forensic pathologist and study violence. And that's what I've been doing. And now I'm like in my second career, I wanna teach it both violence prevention and uh, pathology to this next generation. Now you, you shook me, you got me a little confused. You said the FBI, first of all, is notorious in not investigating the violence in our poor communities. And yet you said that's where the most evidence was coming. Well, what were they doing with the evidence? Cause they ain't solving the crimes for us. So please. Well, you know, you know, I'm also a student of COINTELPRO. I'm also a student of the Black Panther Party um, and understand, um, you know, what the role of the FBI was in dismantling our efforts to become free in this country. Um, so, uh, you know, this was an opportunity for me to gain full insight into how things are done um, and then be a, be a, be a resource uh, for, for community. And so now, particularly free from government um, work in total, um, I look to be, be a resource um, for our community as we as we fight injustice. We're also fighting uh, this virus um, disproportionately. Yeah. Give us some insight into what we can do, because uh, I, I don't know what's coming next. I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, uh, Rona taps out at some point. She got to get tired. Maybe. I don't know. Something's going to maybe the people that are propagating it, maybe they won't be here anymore. I don't know. Uh, but give us some tips or something that can um, give us some hope or insight into ending or will we be living with this forever? And if so, how? Well, listen, you know, since coronavirus started, um, I lost, I think, 12 pounds. Um, and, you know, it's found really, it. yeah, yeah. She, she found yeah, she it. She said Tanya said she found it, right? So, you know, I, I I like, I like self-control, right? Particularly when I'm talking to community because we always want to talk about what other people over there should be doing and how other people over there are doing this to us. And, and, and all that is true, right? So we fight against that. You know, we fight in every aspect against the powers that come against our community. But if, if it's just you, me, and the, the hundreds of thousands of listeners that you have, right? I'm telling them to take control of their own health, right? And, you know, do the things that are necessary um, to become healthy um, and then advocate to create an environment for people that don't know or don't have the access, right, where there's equity that's lacking. So if you have the wherefore, 
to um, have an hour of your day where you're not working two jobs and you can go out and run or walk for 30 minutes, um, then do that. If you have the where for all the properly balance your diet with lean meats and you know vegetables and you know um, good good foods and you know I, I had a piece of pie yesterday so I'm not talking about you know absence of of the things that are are, are that taste good but you know really take control of your own nutrition and your water intake um, supplement your diet with vitamin D vitamin D deficiency is one of the risk factors for the COVID, um, COVID virus um, infection, the morbidity that goes along with it because vitamin D does a lot to help us with inflammation, right? And so- um, so See, I'm a black the, people, yeah, I'm black I mean, women. It's huge, you know, just because we're melanated, we think that we have enough vitamin D and it's a real fallacy. Um, and you can get it by just having a multivitamin, right? And so, but I, these are rich people, you know, solutions right because then that would suggest that you can go to the store and get vitamins right and so you know for those of us that don't have means um then we need to advocate for those means and educate and get out in community and talk to community about the things and then push on our our government to um create equity um so so it's really about us and then you know it you know i was on a a, a panel not too long ago about the vaccine they were like doc you know why are you pro-vaccine? I said, you know, I'm not pro-vaccine. You know, I'm pro pro my people. Uh -huh. So right now, this vaccine is good for my people.